Hi, I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. Today I'll be discussing economic issues with Mr. Eric Hans. He is a program manager for Eurasia at the Center for International Private Enterprise in Washington, D.C. Hello, Mr. Hans. Welcome to UATV. Hi, Alex. Good to be with you. Recently, in a latest article you wrote, you discussed a law which was passed by the Ukrainian government last year, which will allow independent directors to serve on the boards of state-run enterprises. Would you be able to explain what exactly that law is and how it will benefit the Ukrainian economy? Yeah, this is really a, a step forward for corporate governance in Ukraine. Uh, as you might, as your viewers might be aware, the state of enterprises uh, constitute a, a fairly large percentage of the Ukrainian economy. Uh, transparency, accountability, uh, and the tenets of corporate governance are not often uh, fully implemented according to the OEC guidelines. Um, what these independent directors will do will add additional transparency and accountability to these state of enterprises and could be seen as a first step towards eventual privatization. Now, as you know, Ukraine had a, a quite an experience with privatization throughout the 1990s. Hopefully, what these independent directors will do will be able to establish a, an accountable record uh, of stewardship uh, so that these enterprises might eventually be privatized at a market rate. I see. You also mentioned in the same article that the framework for the development of this law is still undeveloped. What did you mean by that? So. Yeah, what exactly constitutes an independent director? Is it a, a nephew of the executive director of the company that just happens to be uh, a familiar with the enterprise? Uh, or is it somebody that's truly independent uh, under uh, some, some kind of standard that's been internationally established, right? Um, so these kind of technicalities within the law uh, are not fully worked out at the moment. What we hope to do at the Center for National Private Enterprise with our partners in Ukraine, the Ukrainian Corporate Governance Professional Association, is to establish uh, these norms of practice so that uh, going forward, you have a really solid understanding of the law, its implications, and a good pattern and practice of, co of solid corporate governance at these state-owned enterprises. What has taken so long to implement this law? Here we are in 2017. It was passed in 2016. It seems like it's taken a long time. Well, implementation is tricky, right? Uh, you know, it's one thing to pass a law, and it's quite another to actually implement it on the ground. It's actually quite common throughout Eurasia, throughout the former Soviet Union, and really around the world, uh, to see these implementation gaps. And really, that's uh, one of the primary focuses of a lot of site programs in emerging markets, is that the law is passed, uh, it's, it's up to international standards, it's been reviewed by experts, but the actual implementation on the ground is often very tricky. Uh, and there are minor details or institutions that aren't yet established. Uh, for example, you know, will there be a code of ethics that's uh, approved by the Ministry of the Economy uh, for these independent directors? You know, I think there should be one, but it's, it's really not that clear through the law. What are the forces driving this law? Is it more internal or are there outside forces, outside governments, NGOs? Uh, so it's a combination of factors. You know, you do have reformers uh, from within Ukraine that are that are driving uh, uh, better governance standards, better, more transparency, uh, more accountability uh, for state-owned enterprises that do take uh, money away from the Ukrainian budget, which is which is very tight. Um, and you also have donors. You have the IFIs, the IMF, the World Bank, and others that are really driving this change. You know, I see uh, better corporate governance practices at state-owned enterprises as a first step towards eventual privatization at a market rate. So you, you won't see these uh, sweetheart deals that go to insiders that know really what a company is worth. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have good standards of, of corporate governance in place prior to privatization, for several years prior to privatization, then you have a better opportunity uh, for the Ukrainian state to realize a good market price uh, that's established by, you know, a, a real market of, that consists of both Ukrainian companies, Ukrainian investors, and Western investors. You write a lot about privatization, you know a lot about it. What are the pitfalls, what are the risks of privatiz privatizing, or privatizing, excuse me, too quickly? So yeah, I mean, we really saw this, uh, these pitfalls in Russia and in Ukraine, right? You have, um, uh, you have a rapid privatization. You have the, sh the loans for share scheme, you, you have uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the coupon scheme. Uh, that, you know, that Ukraine and Russia and, and other former, country, 
countries of the former Soviet Union experienced throughout the 90s. This has left a really bad taste for privatization in people's mouths, and, and by good measure, right? I, I mean, I think uh, one, one uh, economist has put the, the privatization of the enti entire uh, Russian economy throughout the 90s at the valuation of Starbucks a few weeks ago. Uh, so you, you have this, this massive industry that was really privatized for a song, uh, and little benefit accruing to the state. Now, you know, there are about 3,000 enterprises of those, uh, approximately 1,600 are left as operating enterprises in Ukraine. Now, the top 100 uh, account for somewhere 90 plus percent uh, of, of all of, of that in, in Ukraine. And, and those should probably be a special case, right? The top 100 can be concentrated on, and you can really uh, get a, a substantial amount of money in the eventual privatization if that is the course of action that the Ukrainian government chooses to pursue. However, these other 1,500 or so companies that are active uh, but are more opaque are a different question entirely. You know, they, deal, they do still take money from the Ukrainian budget. Uh, there are various schemes employed by, uh, by you know, insiders that, that strip away assets and value from these companies. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really a, a question, the privatization, the speed of privatization is, you know, do you privatize quickly uh, and, and risk uh, uh, insiders getting a good deal uh, risk the violation of uh, due process and, and uh, really establishing a market price for this company? Or, you know, do you have this ongoing minor corruption, uh, or in some cases major corruption, uh, at, at these state-owned enterprises? You know, it's, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of, kind of argument. And, you know, different, different uh, economists, different uh, political scientists see the problem differently. Uh, I, for one, am, am more of a, a establishing for establishing good practice of corporate governance at these state enterprises, uh, and only then and privatizing those assets. You mentioned in an earlier article about the Ukrainian State Property Fund and that it's viewed with skepticism here in Ukraine. Why is that? What is it, and why is that? So the Ukrainian State Property Fund manages uh, the bulk of, of, of Ukrainian state property, right? Um, they're viewed with skepticism for, for some, uh, for some you know, factors, uh, news stories that have broken over the past year, two years, ten years, uh, where insiders inside the, inside the state property fund oftentimes time, end up with really good deals, shall we call them. Um, and you know, these, these, these type of minor scandals are, are ongoing. Uh, you know, so the, the entity that's in control of these state-owned enterprises or the, that has access to these state assets is viewed with skepticism by the Ukrainian public. Now, if there were to be a rapid privatization of these 1,500 or so smaller state-owned enterprises controlled solely by the state property fund, you know, I fear that there would be a populist backlash in Ukraine against these privatizations. Mm -hmm. And in any subsequent Ukrainian government, all of these privatizations would be, would be subject to review. So you have this ongoing privatization, reprivatization, uh, uh, um, you know, cycle that, that's just going to go on and, and again, uh, weaken the, the rule of law in Ukraine. I believe you work in all the countries that made up the former Soviet Union. Uh, but, you know, between Russia, Moldova, Belarus, the Baltic states, how is Ukraine doing in terms of mitigating corruption? Listen, you know, uh, the first step in corruption is that you have to talk about corruption. You know, Ukraine is at that point. Uh, people know it's there. They've identified schemes. There's very, very good Ukrainian journalists, and the Fourth Estate is really doing, doing its job in Ukraine. Uh, there are, you know, there's a level of sophistication in journalism, you know, that that I haven't seen in Ukraine, and I've seen in Ukraine develop over the past ten years. Uh, that's really just probably one of the the leaders of the former Soviet Union. Uh, those areas that have actually implemented reform, the, the pre-Baltics, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that are members of the EU now, uh, they rapidly, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, rapidly uh, uh, adopted free markets and, and or democratic principles. Uh, Ukraine is, is a much tougher case. Uh, listen, we're talking about land reform issues, for example, in Ukraine. It's a very hot topic. Uh, but for a variety of, of, of reasons, uh, land reform in Ukraine is stalled. Listen, you have several instances in the 20th century where Ukrainians were, were 
told that, that their property is no longer theirs. You have the collectivization and decolonization campaign uh, of the 1920s and 30s. Then you literally have you know, the, the Nazis come in and steal the soil from Ukraine. Uh, people have memories. Their, their grandfathers, their grandmothers were affected by this, by this, these, these uh, attempts to, to steal property right out from underneath them. And given the, the privatization experience in the 1990s, people are rightfully skeptical to view any uh, land reform uh, uh, that, that's not completely transparent. With regard to small and medium-sized companies, which you also write a lot about, what are the biggest obstacles these uh, entities face with the current uh, government? So, you know, the, the current government has done a really good job of, of engaging large multinationals, of putting an observant in place to, to answer their issues, uh, to work with the AmCham, to work with the EBA on these investment-related issues. Now, these issues still exist, uh, but, but they're getting better. Now, if you, if you take that down a few steps to Ukrainian small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, you know, the, the people working at the kiosk, the people working uh, that have a few kiosks or a few restaurants around the city, they still face a litany of, of issues. Uh, everything from advertising regulation to uh, property rights to zoning issues uh, to uh, these constant uh, appeals by uh, by state officials, uh, fire inspectors, police inspectors, uh, jewelry inspectors, uh, for you know a little cut of the take along the way, and it's very hard hard to fight that very small corruption. Specifically, as once you get down into the regional level at, at the smaller uh, smaller business level. So do a lot of these small, medium-sized businesses, do they make up uh, the informal economy of Ukraine? Yeah, so the informal economy, it's tough to measure, right? Because by, by its very nature, it's, it's informal and unregistered. Uh, but the latest estimates put it between 40 and 50 percent of GDP in Ukraine. Uh, so, you know, if I were sitting in the government of Ukraine, I would, I would look for ways to incentivize those small and medium-sized enterprises to come out of the gray sector of the economy to join the legal, uh, the legal uh, economy and to pay taxes uh, and to be a officially a registered business. You know, there, there's a lot of advantages out there for that, uh, but, but the state can, can take a role in incentivizing, not just penalizing, but incentivizing uh, businesses to come out of the gray economy. You mentioned in the article that these large companies, the private ones, would take on independent directors in order to get uh, easier access to credit. Do small and medium-sized companies, do they have sufficient access to credit? Yeah, I mean, so one of the most successful uh, small enterprises that, that's really a large enterprise now in Ukraine is Nova Pochta, right? So you have this company that's, that's come out of almost nowhere uh, just by, by sheer skill uh, and entrepreneurial talent uh, and some assistance along the way of some key individuals uh, and built a business based solely on Ukrainian infrastructure. This is not a privatized business. And you, you see this more and more in Ukraine as, as uh, companies like Rezietka uh, uh, come up uh, and, and are, are working in the Ukrainian marketplace. They're not privatized companies. These, these are entrepreneurs that have been taking risks uh, and that have been slowly adopting uh, corporate governance principles like independent directors, which has allowed them access to lower cost of capital, uh, access to Western investors, Western uh, uh, technology, Western uh, know-how, management skills, uh, and what have you. So this is really kind of a, a big step uh, in the development of, of the Ukrainian economy, in my opinion. Well, thank you so much. We ran out of time, but thank you so much, Mr. Holtz, for joining us today. Will you come back? Be happy to. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. This is Alex Gupta with UATV. Thank you so much.